Hi, I'm Jerry Boyer. Welcome to Meeting of Minds with Jerry Boyer. Um, my guest today is Dr. Peter Jacobson from Ottawa University, uh, where he heads up the uh, Gwartney Institute. Um, he is also a frequent writer and a podcaster who hosts an excellent faith and economics podcast. Uh, Dr. Jacobson, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Jerry. It's great to be here. Well, one of the things that you've written about, I just recently read um, an article from you, uh, you wrote from my friend Hugh Welsh at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics about population control, the book that 40 years ago explained population dynamics. Population's a pretty key idea for you, and it is for me as well. So tell us a little bit, a little bit about your work on overpopulation, population, uh, Malthusianism, and you know that whole zone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for asking that, Jerry. I think I came into this field because I had a similar experience to a lot of people that growing up, however it comes into like it's in the water or something, most people tend to get this idea that just as like it pervades the culture that the world is overpopulated. If you go and ask 10 people on the streets, do we have the right population, too many people or too few people? My guess is nine out of 10 are going to say, oh, we're overpopulated. We have too many people. Hmm. Uh, so this somehow became something that I thought I don't even know how it seeped into the subconscious somehow. Uh, and then I started reading a little bit about it. Uh, and in reading about it, I uh, uncovered a, a, a scholar, Julian Simon. Uh, who is an economist who passed away in the late 90s, uh, who had written a lot about uh, population growth. And specifically in The Ultimate Resource 2, he makes the case that all of the available evidence shows us that the, the idea that the world is overpopulated is exactly wrong. That in fact, when we have larger population growth and larger populations, there tends to be more prosperity, cleaner environments. Uh, you pick a, a factor that matters to you, it seems better. Uh, when there's more people. Hmm. Uh, and his explanation is pretty straightforward. It's that people create problems, but they also create solutions and they happen to create more solutions on that. And so this really inspired me to, to look into and continue on this research program. Uh, and I'm really motivated by the facts that uh, people are so wrong about this and so boldly wrong about this. Hmm. Uh, it frustrates me when I, I read something about overpopulation when uh, all the evidence is to the contrary. Yeah, and uh, my friend Rich Cargard has made the observation that maybe maybe the one idea that all modern toxic ideologies share in common is a commitment to the idea of population growth as being a bad thing, whether it's your not, Nazi, Nazism, communism, Keynesian, you know, all, all, of, the, all the bad isms. Um, you know, a, a kind of a fundamentalist Darwinism, um, you know, all of the bad isms basically all come down to the mistake that more people are more problems, not more solutions. Yeah. And un unfortunately, what, what really uh, drives me crazy about this is especially you heard about it more in the 70s and 80s. This became a platform of basically the United States' development uh, thinking. And so uh, the U U.S. Uh, foreign aid has had several stages and basically every big idea in foreign aid is, well, let's observe something that's true about the U.S. and try to make it true of other countries and hope development follows. Mm. And so we've had a period where we focus on, well, let's give them a bunch of we have a lot of factories. Let's give them a bunch of factories. Right. And this, this doesn't work. Uh, there was a period of, well, let's give everybody an education. Uh, and so we try that and, you know, it doesn't do anything either. Uh, and it turns out like this is because this is just some like very simple, simplistic thinking that correlation is causation, which it's not. Uh, and one of the things that was tried and actually is still being tried today is they said, well, the U.S. Uh, population replacement rate is uh, at the time, the 70s and 80s, is closer to, to two and a half. And these countries are at like six. They're having too many kids. Classic Malthusian concern. Hmm. And so one of the infuriating things is that we have imposed on other countries or tried to impose, uh, you know, both cultural thinking, but also uh, actual policies um, of having less children. And when you understand the truth that uh, population actually breeds entrepreneurship, new ideas, new people creating new ideas, uh, what you see is we have policies that are actively damaging people to hurt growth in the future. Hmm. Uh, again, whether it, it, intentional or not, you know, regardless of your thoughts of what causes it, what, what is you know, really frustrating is that we have uh, money going towards making people worse off. And, and stopping people from coming into existence. I mean, we're bribe, yeah. we're, we are bribing the third world 
to not um, bring people into the world. Um, with, yeah, we, and- even with support for one child policies, kind of quiet support for like forced abortion policies. I mean, yes. it's not just about, hey, we'll pay for all your contraception, in India. Um, it's it was a kind of act of collaboration with grisly top-down social engineering experiments. Yes, the, the United Nations uh, gave both India and China uh, the population award after their coercive population control pro- programs were implemented and people knew about it. In fact, one of the economists who was on the decision-making authority, I think it's Theodore Schultz, Schultz uh, economic uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, stepped down because he said this is, he basically said, I can't have my name associated with an organization who's going to give an award to someone who's coercively sterilizing people. Wow. And, and we saw this. I didn't know too. that. Have you written about that or you, you've uh, just read about it? I, I've, uh, Simon mentions it briefly. I have, I think I have mentioned it in a few articles offhanded, but okay. but not. I haven't written a full article on it or anything, any sort of history. Fascinating. Uh, so, and China's so that, dealing with it right now. Yes, the Chinese yeah. economy is right now in a state of crisis because they nationalized education companies because they have they so normalized one child policy that people are now even when they're uh, allowed to have more children they won't so they're trying so they're nationalizing education companies so they can make education free so they can get people to breed yep. to make up for you know this colossal loss of people um, yeah. and it's like well okay uh, that i mean even if you succeed that's not going to start to matter until 18 years from now right yeah i mean they, you know they, you can't put the babies to work i'm sure you'd that, like to that's right. uh, president that's right. xi uh you know but the babies aren't going to work um and they're collapsing cities there are empty cities and they're just literally destroying them because if you're missing 50 to 100 million people then there aren't enough people to fill up those buildings and that's that's currently the, the chickens are coming home to roost right now with China. Yeah, that's right. I, I've actually uh, drafted up an article, haven't published it yet and uh, ha- haven't really decided where to put it exactly. But I, I think <clears> this. <throat> I, I, <laughs> excuse yeah, me. I, 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 I hear you. <clears throat> you got a little something there, in my Jerry. throat there. Oh. Uh, I, I think uh, this uh, to me, this might be China's fatal conceit moment. This mm. might be. Uh, you know, the the thing that people will re- who lived through it will tell you about the Soviet Union is that one day it was and then one day it wasn't. And people were amazed and, and no one expected that suddenly it would be gone. Mm-hmm. In fact, the, the, one of the leading economists at the time, Paul Samuelson, who I think did, did a lot of harm uh, to the economic profession in general, uh, he would publish in his textbook yearly like an estimate of how many years till the Soviet Union overtakes the United States. And it was like five <laughs> years, 10 years. And he kept, of course, pushing it back. Of course. After the first five. <laughs> Uh, and then the Soviet Union's gone, and like the, you know, people wonder what happened. This could be that for China. I'm not. I, I'm not bold enough to make that prediction that this is the end of China or anything like that. But the 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 funny thing, uh, or maybe dismal, grim thing, ironic, I guess, is maybe the best way to say it. Uh, is first off, this was based off, of course, Mao, uh, who there's still a lot of reverence for in China. Uh, his, his fear of what he called the anarchy of human production, and his comment was, "Well, if we're going to." Uh, plan from a central level the economy, then we should be planning the human production too. Uh, th- these were his exact words as he was, a f- he, he didn't want anarchy of human production. He wanted plans human production. Uh, and there's some evidence out there that uh, the engineers of the one child policy in China actually borrowed from uh, the club of Rome's limits to growth model, which mm. was one of the main things that Julian Simon argued uh, for. And this uh, limits to growth model was, basically showing that uh, overpopulation was going to destroy the whole world, you know, right. basically a bunch of nonsense that never panned out. The model uh, is, is totally debunked, not even a shred of credibility anymore. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, China's policy was somewhat based on this approach. Well, a point that uh, Paul Johnson makes, um, that authentic, revolutionary, non-aligned or third world ideologies aren't in any way authentic to their cultures. They're all That's right. imports of Western ideas frequently with a German accent. Um, so, yes. uh, or sometimes they'll go to Oxford and they'll learn something that has nothing, that's, that, that is not at all native to say Zimbabwe, right? But they come back saying, we're gonna have our own authentic ideology, which is, you know, junk thinking that um, we in the West had the, the wisdom not to completely impose on ourselves, but we can send them back. You know, we can send like the, like the royal class back, you know, with, with those the same ideas. So, um, 
Um, yeah, no, you're, you're right. And, and this, so we've, we've mentioned India, we've mentioned China. Uh, this was a problem in, in uh, the Southern Hemisphere as well. Uh, Peru right. in, in, in South America in the 90s had a, a large coercive sterilization program. The numbers are hard to determine exactly. We know that during the program, over 700,000 people were sterilized. We don't know how many of those were, were coerced versus voluntary mm-hmm. or full consent or these things. But we do know there was a significant amount of coercion going on. Got it. Uh, and I, and I've, I've, got, I've, I've gone to the USA Development Archives mm-hmm. uh, based around that time. Oh. And what was going on? Well, we were... We were sending uh, U.S. people to engage in, in uh, you know, population projects that involved uh, adding community centers. Many of these community centers were later found to be sort of like the, the hotbeds of leading the, the charge on the sterilization. Uh, they were recommending the use of permanent sterilization techniques uh, because it's cheaper, basically. They would say uh, we have more of a guaranteed impact with this and mm. it's permanent. Mm. Uh, and, and these are all, you know, in, in the USAID archives. And meanwhile... Uh, saying things about other countries like, oh, we need to create a population lobby in Peru, in right. Haiti, rather. Right. Uh, so, so unfortunately, yeah. Our and no Western doubt, disproportionately the poor, which means disproportionately the native Indian class. Yes. Right. Yeah. Rather than those who have European blood. I mean, they're not they're not sterilizing in a ethnically neutral way. <laughs> Right. No, no, not at all. Uh, you know, a lot of the the material is marketed. You know, the the saddest propaganda is always that what they'll do in, in some of these uh, again, some U.S. funded propaganda uh, still made by the the people in the country of Brazil under the Fujimori regime. But they'll show like a, a native uh, you know family there, uh, and they've got seven children, and they're they're poor, and you know obviously you have dirty clothes and all this. And then they'll put it with, next to like this this white family with two kids, and they'll say, "Oh, you should have two kids," and this will be like the the punchline of the propaganda, very heavy handed. Right, be like uh, white but, people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Many brown like, babies, yeah. Yeah, uh, and you'll be rich and you'll have clean clothes and you'll have a car and you'll have a house instead of, you know, living where you live. I just have uh, gotten this kind of this random synchronicity, obscure pun popping in my head, the irony of Peru, which is the Hebrew word for be fruitful. Um, yeah, you that know, is in, in the Bible, Peru or vu, be fruitful and multiply. Um, and, um, and, and it is a biblical, um, it's a central biblical idea which I think is why Christians, not just Roman Catholics who have, you know, a, an opposition to a contraception of all form, but a, a lot of the opposition to this co- population control stuff comes from Christians. Now, Malthus himself was, was a minister, um, but Malthus, I'm not sure that Malthus ever actually endorsed, um, you know, the idea of any, certainly forced population control. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think... Malthus might himself be misunderstood. He might not have been a Malthusian, um, right? So, uh, but it's interesting. He he does talk about the, you know, cursed is the ground because of you, but in, you know, by, by this a sweat of your brow, you'll bring forth bread. So he saw a theological issue. He saw the curse, but he didn't see the blessing. He didn't see the redemption, which caused him to be pessimistic. But I'm not right. sure how prescriptive that ever got with Malthus. You, yeah. You know, no, I, I don't think. It, and there's also a, a recognition of, of Malth, Malthus, basically, of a certain degree to which he realized that uh, his initial formulation was too thin. And so Malthus in uh, I can't remember, he had a lot of editions, but in the second to last edition, he, w- he was pretty much uh, doom and gloom about things. But by the last edition, he had revised and said, well, perhaps like we will be able to outrun these things or people will be able to, you know, create their own norms that will allow them to have the proper number of children. Basically, he granted individuals a little bit more intelligence by the end and a little bit more uh, wisdom. And yeah, you're, you're right. He, he did say that if we didn't, he basically said, if we don't, if we don't, if we don't change will. something, right. Yes. yes. But we yeah. did change something. Right. Yeah, and, right. And, and by the way, I don't, you're probably aware of this, but there's a book, I have a correspondence between Malthus and Jean-Baptiste Say. Right. Right. Sort of, in some sense, the founder of, of supply side economics, Say's yes. Law, which is, focuses on production. Um, so maybe Say had some influence. It's a, oh, wait, maybe the growth can exceed the, the population, which is in fact what it did. Um, yeah. It's starting almost exactly then. No, you're, 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 you're right. I think that there, there was probably some influence there. And I, I, I would agree that Malthus at least w- is not what we would call Malth- or Malthusian today. Right. Malthusians today, uh, neo-Malthusians, you could call them, uh, 
not even for the same reasons as Malthus. In fact, if Malthus were alive today, I'm sure that he would totally recant what he said because Malthus's primary uh, concern was that there wouldn't be enough food production. Right. Uh, right. Now, by, by any literal measure, we have enough food to feed everybody. We have a global uh, obesity epidemic. Yes, that, that's right. Yeah. And so uh, new Malthusians tend to focus on something else like environment or, or you know, climate change, whatever it may be, uh, or just development in general. Uh, but certainly Malthus wouldn't be a Malthusian today. Yeah. So the, the timing is fascinating at exactly the time when those ideas were spreading. And after Malthus, they are spreading. Um, you know, they kind of re, the, the intellectual class of England was caught up with this. You and I talked about this a little before. I'm not going to get in heavily into my stuff, but I'm thoroughly convinced that Dickens a Christmas Carol is a polemic against Malthus you know starting out with the quote then let them die and decrease the surplus population then later the ghost of Christmas present saying he had 1800 brothers and Scrooge says what a tremendous family to provide for and the ghost of Christmas present rises up in anger and reaches for his sword reaches to his scabbard for his sword but there isn't any sword there um, you know, he's long, long put away his sword. And then later lectures um, Scrooge, you know, what, uh, uh, re- quoting him back to himself, surplus population in the case of T- Tiny Tim, you know, man, if thou be a, a, a man in thy heart, you know, release that cant. Should the, I don't have the exact quote, but should the insect on the leaf render judgment on its brothers in the dirt? Um, as to who is who is uh, worthy um, to survive. Um, yeah, no, that, that's a great point. And I, I never, I had always heard that quote and I, I was always glad, oh, that's good that, you know, Dickens is going after this like goofy idea because obviously that's like the, the, the reading of that. Uh, but I, I never considered Tiny Tim really almost the, emo- the emotional center of the story is really the embodiment of, you know, someone who eugenicists would be would would say exactly what Scrooge said about. I mean, he, yes. he's uh, young and has what, whatever illness we don't exactly. I don't think we exactly know. I don't maybe, think we, maybe know. we do. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you and poor family. And so a eugenicist would say, oh, this is exactly the type of person who we don't need. And of course, uh, Scrooge's conversion is, is contingent on like, oh, I don't want Tiny Tim to die. Right. Uh, so, so I, I, you, you've got a great point there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, you know, Scrooge's alienation from his nephew, Fred, you know, uh, why are you angry? Right. Why can't we be friends? Scrooge says, why did you marry? It's not a non sequitur, right? Um, Scrooge was an antinatalist, um, reflecting the kind of the paranoia of the time. Yeah. Um, wow. Uh, again, I'd heard that quote, but I, I hadn't put it like I never thought of that as being the the center message. But but I think you've moved me in that direction. Oh, yeah, uh, so I can't stop on this now. So what, <laughs> Ghost of Christmas Present takes them where? Takes them to the marketplace, and there's descriptions of Spanish onions and fruit, you know, uh, from the you know from around the world. So there's a trade thing going on here, right? Because this is after the repeal of the Corn Laws. Um, you know, when this is said, I think this is written in the 1840s. Um, so England had opened up trade barriers and had abundance. So there's, you know, I think this story has been abused. Um, all right. So, but that's my work. Let's go, let's go uh, back to your work. Um, you've looked at this a lot. I've wondered, I'm just throwing this at you as a curveball. Sometimes I've wondered the degree to which even before modern, you know, post Club of Rome stuff, the degree to which the ruling class of the United States and its eugenics tendencies, I mean, that's obviously there much earlier. You've got it in the 1920s even. I've, but I've wondered to what degree paranoia over population was a feeder to the war mindset. In other words, you're sending men, men off by the hundreds of thousands to die in World War I a kind of a sense that the ruling class had that, you know, look, we've got we've got people to spare here um, and there's already too many. Um, and this is the periodic purging which civilization needs. Um, have you do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, there, there certainly is a connection there. Um, a, a scholar who uh, I guess a Christian feminist scholar who, whose work I, I've read a lot of is uh, Elizabeth Ligon. I think she, later she went by Elizabeth Sobo uh, and not a very well-known. She wasn't a professor or anything. She's just an independent researcher, uh, but she did a lot of FOIA requests. Uh, and in the, at least in the, the 60s and 70s, 
one of the primary drivers, uh, and you know, this is all government documents, you, you can find this, I think it's even on Wikipedia, one of the primary drivers of, of population uh, control was from the, the, the defense industry. And so basically, wow. the, in these uh, national security memorandums, I think it's national security memorandum, memorandum 200, I could be wrong about that, but I think it, that's the one. Uh, it says basically, well, to protect U.S. Uh, interests, we need to keep population in these developing countries low, because if we don't, they're going to start competing for our resources. Mm. So this was actually even if, of course, this is never said out loud. And in fact, they sp- specifically say in the memorandum. Don't say this by- out loud. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, they say we need to we need to make it first seem like it's from the indigenous population that as if like the country's cr- created the idea themselves and we need to uh, distance ourselves as much as possible from it. And and so, yeah, there's definitely connection here between uh, almost like a a nationalistic fear of the prosper. And there's a zero sum mentality thing going on as well. There really is. That we, we, if we believe the world is this closed system and other people have more, that must mean we have less. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's almost like a a scrooge mentality. So yes, there is an explicit defense connection between uh, population fear Population fears and war. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't want the other nations to grow too big. Yeah, that's right. right. And yeah. to, to what degree are we were we willing to send men off to die, especially minority men, but or poor men, because we got surplus population. Yeah, I I, I think that that's uh, you, you actually you can find that relationship if you. Uh, look at uh, different countries across different time periods. There's a, a literature called the youth bulge literature, mm. which says that basically when you have a large young male population, uh, there's more likely to be conflicts. And that, that certain certainly could be. Uh, so you know, so we make our youth bulge fight their youth bulge and the ruling right. class solves, each ruling class gets a solution to their problem. Yeah, yeah. There, there, there could be uh, like the... Uh, there could be something that someone would view as a, a win-win situation there. Right. Uh, you know, By the way, I'm, I'm, the I'm speculating. Values. So we're going to make the distinction yes. between yeah. stuff where there's hard evidence and stuff that it seems like it's there, but requires more, you know, maybe more analysis and more explanation. But Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. But I know this, the Discovery Institute has done some documentation. There definitely was a Darwinian impulse that was strong going into World War One. So there's something that Darwin based his work on Malthus. So there's definitely something going on there. Um, there is there is an intellectual lineage, how explicit it was. And of course, who's going to say it? You know, who's going to say, there's too many Indians, let's go kill some, right? Um, or we, we got too many young men. By the way, I think that's what might save China. You know, the, 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 that essentially the age group, the youth bulge that would be rising up to throw off their oppressors has 50 to 100 million people missing. In, in other words, China doesn't have enough young people to have a revolution. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. because it, it, when I've looked at population ones. genetics, you know, all of the Arab Spring countries where you had a regime change had an, um, a, a median age between like 23 and 26. Right. So if you don't have that youth bulge, you really don't find a lot of revolutions. Yeah, that, that's exactly right now. Uh, one of the great things that that Simon uh, highlighted, he had this uh, title on the nose for his paper, Liebenstrom, Living Space, mm. because this was actually like the, the Nazi idea is, well, we need more living, living space. But one of the insights Simon that Simon highlighted was actually over the long run, uh, large populations might tend to lower conflicts. And I think he, he's basically right on this. Again, this is a long run argument, not a short run argument. So I, I think that what you said is compatible with this. And Simon's argument is, well, if it's true that we get more resource abundance when we have more people, which is what his research uh, shows, there's actually less need to expand geographically. You don't need the living space if you have plenty of resources in your lands because you have really uh, advanced methods of extracting the resources. Right. So I, I, I am an eternal optimist about population, even when it comes to conflict. But I do agree with you that uh, China ha- is somewhat limited in a good way uh, both with civil conflict, but also uh, inter external conflict. Conflict. It's really hard to beat the war drums when you don't have very many people. Yeah, right. Uh, now, now, or, and they still people. have a lot, right. and, and they have they have technology still, and that's becoming right. more important. But yeah, everything else held constant. Uh, right. They they are maybe less able to try to expand militarily, which is nice. Yes, um, I, the scenario I worry about is sort of Rome and the rape of the Sabine woman, women. Right, like they don't have enough women. 
at what point do they start, you know, yeah. to try to deal with that? Now, yeah, uh, and uh, to what extent have they already done that with the 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 Uyghur Uyghur? I can never pronounce Uyghur, it quite right. Uyghur, uh, right. Uyghur population, right? Uh, so right. yeah, I think there's something. You take there. the women, or you take the organs, or or whatever, right? Um, now maybe it'll be voluntary. Maybe wealthy uh, Chinese men will be able to marry. Filipino women, you know, the volunteer, I don't know, but they, I mean, they've got a problem. Um, and the problem is a bad idea and it's not their bad idea. It's our bad idea that we talk them into. Um, and I think that's still out there with our own ruling class, the idea of population growth, you know, being a problem. Um, so this, we, yeah, still, yeah. we still need to kill Malthusianism. That's right. If you go to, I uh, gosh, I can't remember which news station or website had uh, last year, like a carbon ca footprint calculator. I mean, the quickest way to double your carbon footprint on that calculator is to have more kids. Uh, if you if you talk to a climate change person, one of their primary concerns that they have is uh, basically we need to stop having so many so many children. And in fact, you'll get this weird relationship between uh, anti-immigration conservatives. Yes. And there's a, there's a big uh, group of anti-immigration left-wingers because their their stated fear is that we don't want a bunch of poor people to move to rich countries because then they'll put out more carbon and create climate change. Wow. And so like whether, you know, they want to say it explicitly or not, the unfortunate thing that they're saying is we don't want too many people to be rich. So we need to keep them poor. What an, uh, that, that's Horrible. a worse re that, that's a worse reason for immigration restrictions than nationalism in my book. Yeah, I'd and rather it's, you it's, just be and, a, a, and a it's Trump on the right. President Trump tweeted out basically Mexicans don't come here. We don't have enough room. Right. Yeah. We yeah, don't have but, enough room. I mean, if you've flown <laughs> over this country, that's right. Yeah, we got a lot yeah. of room now. You know, we, there's issues about cultural assimilation and all the rest of it. But please, we've got enough room. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I, I, I can't remember the old uh, the 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 true, uh, you know, observation. It's something like that. All of the people in the U.S. could could fit in the state of Texas with a house and like a very small yard or something like yeah, that. Right. Uh, yeah. Obviously, I've you know, you run into problems yeah. of geography and things like that, uh, right. having access to resources. But uh, space is not a problem. Right. We have right. plenty of living space. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking you mentioned carbon footprint. Who has a smaller carbon footprint than Ebenezer Scrooge? No children. That's true. And he heats he heats two rooms with one piece of coal. Um, so perfect minimalist. There's your there. Um, zero population growth people. Behold your hero, Ebenezer Scrooge. Yeah, that's that's right. You know, you can he can live in a drawer and all this stuff. So yeah, right. A little bit, little bit of weak broth, as I remember. That, yeah, you know, that's that right. He had for dinner. So um, he's he's doing his part. Uh, okay, we've talked about population growth. Another thing that you've been working on a fair amount is inflation. Um, inflation dynamics, et, et cetera. So can you kind of give us the overview of what you've been saying about inflation, what you've been thinking, what do people miss, and where do you think we are now? Yeah, so uh, inflation has, uh, I started writing about inflation, uh, I think in March of this year before it started to really hit. And I, I actually, when it started to you know go up and I, I made the simple and I try to continue to make the simple observation uh, that you would get if you looked at Milton Friedman's work on the quantity theory of money, or you would get it if you looked at Mises and the Austrian school, uh, the very simple relationship that as you increase the supply of money, everything else held constant, the value of money is going to go down. And this is true of everything. It's not just money. Money's not unique here. Anytime you increase the supply of something, its value goes down. Uh, right. Again, everything else held constant. Everything else held constant. And, that's so right. So if there are demand dynamics too. Yes, that, right? that's, exactly, that's exactly right. And so one of the things that people don't realize is in, I think it was March of 2020. That's why I started writing about it. Then we really actually January, even of 2020, we really started increasing the amount of money M2 out there. So if you go to the federal reserve of St. Louis website, Fred, and you look at the M2 money supply, M2 SL is the data set. Uh, you can see, you know, it's going on a pretty stable curve up until January, 2020. And that's a straight up line. Right. Uh, we, we increased our money supply at that time over that year by like 33% or something like that. In other words, like one in four dollars that were floating around at the end of 2020. We're brand we created new, in 2020. new baby yeah. dollars. Yeah, right. that's right. And yeah. so there's your increase in the supply of money. And a lot of people at that time were saying, well, we don't have inflation, so no big deal. In fact, uh, I, I don't spend too much time talking to this group because I, I think this is actually more of a fad than a, a serious intellectual drive, though maybe I'll be proven wrong. There's this... Uh, 
a new thinking. Uh, new, now I even forget the name. Uh, new monetary policy. Modern monetary uh, theory. Yes, mo modern. There we go. That's what right. I said. Modern monetary theory. And right. they said, well, look, we didn't have inflation, and we can actually do this as much as we want, and we don't have to worry about inflation. And they eventually say maybe we'll have to worry about inflation. But uh, what what you pointed out is, well, the reason we didn't have inflation right away is demand was low. People right. were in their houses. They were locked down. A lot of businesses were shut down. Uh, people were holding money because they're afraid of what's going to happen with coronavirus in the future. But now what we're seeing is our money supply is still higher. So our M is still higher. And now demand is starting to pick back up. Right. And now we're seeing the inflation. And so uh, quantity theory of money, if our money supply increased by 30 percent, that means uh, that thir and if demand returns uh, to normal, that 30 percent will come back in. Now, it might be 5 percent at a time. We might never hit hyperinflation levels, right. but we will increase prices uh, uh, quite a bit again uh, if demand continues to increase. Uh, so right, yeah, actually, what I was saying, experience. demand. I mean, you get, get, uh, make a good point about de demand for consumer goods and services. I was actually thinking about demand for money. Oh yes, right. Yeah, so right. there's the kind of the debate between Milton Friedman and the supply uh, on one side and the supply siders and the Austrians on the other side, where Milton Friedman focuses very much on supply of money, and supply of money is important. It's half of supply and demand, but maybe not so much on demand for money. So, you know, as as commerce speeds up, that's demand for money. Or as foreign investors, you know, hoard dollars, um, you know, as hedges against the euro or or whatever, um, or as regulators force banks to hold greater reserves, that creates a demand for money. So we had a, we created a lot of money in two thousand nine and two thousand ten as well, but we had a disinflationary episode. Right, because the value of money is a function of the supply for, of money and the demand for money. Yeah, uh, Jim Gordon actually has a really interesting paper on that recently about uh, you know uh, changing demographics and how uh, older people tend to lend and younger people tend to borrow. And his argument is that we've had this uh, change dynamic because we have a, a larger older population now. In general, monetary policy is going to be less inflationary compared to like the seventies. Uh, where we had a lot of young people who are more willing to go and spend the money. Right. So that, that's an interesting, I should read that paper. It, I mean, there's kind of two issues here. When I've looked at it cross-sectionally, there's no doubt that there's a negative correlation between average age um, and inflation rates and a negative correlation between old age dependency ratios and inflation rates. What I've wondered is, is that consumer dynamics or is that political policy outcomes? In other words, pensioners don't want their money messed with, right? Because they're kind of in survival mode, not survival, but you know what I'm saying. They're in preservation mode. Do you, do you, um, does Guartney deal with that or do you have any thoughts about that? No, uh, he, he doesn't. He mo mostly focuses on the net lender, net borrower aspects. But I, I think that's a really interesting point because yeah, there, there's a, a certain conservatism in being right at retirement age, right? You don't want, uh, I mean, you're going to have closer to bonds and cash. So you don't want bonds and cash to become invaluable. Yes. You don't, you don't really want the stock market taking off relative to cash because when you're old, you're moving out of stocks and moving into more, you know, stable assets. So right. yeah, I, I, if I you're definitely in a, think that's if, if you're in the standard 60-40, then you're in bonds and most people aren't in tips because those are a little exotic. Um, most big bond funds don't aren't even allowed to hold them. I mean, by their own policies under their methodology. So you, if you're a bondholder, inflation is the only thing you're really worried about, right? You don't need growth. You're going to get paid either way, especially if they're sovereign bonds, right? They're not going to default. So, uh, so it's an interesting point. So uh, you've also done work on cryptocurrencies or some thinking about cryptocurrencies. One of the things I've been thinking about, I'm throwing things at you just like we didn't even talk about before. So you might not have any thoughts on them. But the degree to which our, our cryptocurrencies are kind of a gigantic monetary experiment, right? And cryptocurrencies are very focused on demand, excuse me, on supply, right? The idea is you can't infinitely, infinitely expand Bitcoin. You can't infinitely expand. Okay. But so what happens is they have fairly stable um, expansion rates, Right, because you have the having principle, yeah. you make some more, right. then, you, then you don't make as much, then you don't make as much because you're moving. It's asymptotic curve until you hit zero, right? Um, zero new, so you hit a wall eventually um, at 21 million bitcoins, and and Dogecoin doesn't have the limit, but you're still they're stable in supply, but they haven't been stable in price, which means that 
they aren't stable in demand. I mean, it has to be. If you're stable in supply changes and you're not stable in price, you have to be unstable in demand. That's right, yeah. So, so any, any thoughts you have on this, even off the cuff, would be welcome. Yeah, well, I see crypto uh, as primarily, I, I'm a, a big fan of having competition in currencies. I think competition in general is beneficial. I think having different ideas uh, running in terms of, you know, Dogecoin versus uh, Bitcoin. Should we have unlimited expansion or just a little bit of expansion, uh, you know, uh, or no expansion in Bitcoin's case? Uh, all these different competing ideas, if we allow people to make profits and losses out of them, we're going to be able to find what is the most valuable combination of different types of currencies. Hmm. So I like cryptocurrency really for uh, even more than any particular cryptocurrency. I like the idea of crypto because inside crypto is almost this, this poison pill. It's like uh, something that uh, Hayek had this famous quote that in order to pry currency out of the government's hands, we're not going to be able to do it with policy. We're going to have to uh, allow they're going to have to allow us to do something that they can't change their minds on after they've allowed it. Yes, and I think I think Bitcoin is that it's not something that they can take back now that it's happened. Too big. They can't. Uh, yeah. They can't illegalize it. Right. Yeah. I unless they want to shut off the internet. I guess that's the that's right. the one switch they could. But the internet's too productive, so I don't think that'll happen. Uh, uh, you know, we've seen China try to, but I think even they can't really succeed at stem stymieing uh, crypto. So so that's that's what I see its benefit. The other benefit is. Uh, it, it requires government authorities to a certain extent to keep things in check. Uh, when you have an alternative currency that's easily available, it's hard for you to manufacture seniorage from your currency. Yes. And so uh, when we have inflation, whether monetary authorities like it or not, they're going to have to be more careful with their policies or people are going to switch away. And to a certain extent, they know that. I think that's why Janet Yellen now is saying like, oh, crypto is such a threat to uh, United States security, I think she'll say. But really, the big threat it is. I to think it's a threat to her. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> a th it's a threat to the government's ability to collect money from us from uh, seniorage, from from printing money. Yes, I see. So you're kind of in on the idea of high XD nationalization of money. Let's have the competition without saying, hey, I think it's going to win or I think this one's going to win versus that one. Um, although if you have any opinions on that, I, I, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, um, I don't know how deeply you are into this. Yeah, I tend to be just a, a, a Bitcoin guy. Part of that comes from I, I'm, I'm not like a hugely digital person, like a technologically capable. I, I can do a little bit in terms of coding, but not a ton. Hmm. And, and my understanding with Bitcoin talking to people is that you can build on top of Bitcoin a lot of things. And so Bitcoin, I have a lot of confidence in. I also like Ethereum because Ethereum allows you to create like unique identifiers. That's what NFTs are, but basically you can create this unique, almost like internet ID badge. Right. Uh, I'm not a huge NFT person in general, but the idea of allowing you to make something that can't be reproduced digitally, that's really valuable. So mm. I, I'm a bit, I, I like Ethereum from that perspective, but I think Bitcoin can, I like the limited supply. I like that there's no founder who can come in and change things. Right. Uh, and those, and the fact that it's known about, I think that Bitcoin will continue to uh, be the primary crypto just for, for those reasons alone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's got primary move, you know, prime mover advantage. It's got a huge amount of market share. It's got a lot of visibility. Um, it has stronger limits. Dogecoin doesn't have limits. That's also what worries me, because if if you if there's a point at which you can't expand the supply anymore, even at a reasonable amount, does it become a deflationary currency? Right? Yeah, the, the, that that is a concern because pe when people lose it, it's gone forever, right? And so the the question is like it can only shrink. That, that's right. Yeah, right. yeah. E even if it's uh, one tenth of a bitcoin a year, I mean, if there's only twenty thousand, that's a pretty serious uh, rate at some point. Right. So, and I mean price deflationary in the sense that as it gains value. Even if even if the supply stays at 21 million, as it gains value, um, that means that the prices of other things are lower in terms of it. I mean, we know from the history of the gold standard, when gold got to a certain went up to a certain price, then we mined more gold, right? See, that's the demand dynamic. As the economy is growing, then there's more gold, right? The economy is growing, and gold are growing at roughly the same rate. But if Bitcoin hits that ceiling and the economy keeps growing. Will the Bitcoin economy, will the prices of things bought in Bitcoin continue to drop? And if that's the case, don't we have all the problems associated with deflation historically? Um, 
So anyway, I, yeah, I would say one nice thing though is it, it at the very least it won't be uh, totally unpredictable deflation, and so if deflation is very easily predictable, I mean you build it into contracts and other things like that, you right. can avoid some of the problems. Now, That's will it point. be easily predictable? Things like that uh, would Bitcoin ever be a big enough single currency for people to bother building it into contracts? Uh, that's a different question, but I, I do think there's some hope for it avoiding those issues. Yeah, that's a good point. You can put that in the, that can be reflected in the interest rate, right? Like deflation is hard on the lenders, right? Uh, deflation, inflation is good, good for borrowers. Deflation, I think I said that wrong. Inflation is good for borrowers. Deflation is bad for borrowers, right? So if we're lending Bitcoins back and forth, you know, there's a certain default risk um, if it, if we have, if it gains in value too much, you buy Bitcoins at 50,000 when they're worth $50,000 and you pay them back when they're worth $80,000, right? There's a loss of value. Anyway, we're probably getting a little bit too much in the weeds on this. Um, so Peter, is there anything else you uh, before I let you go that's uh, on your mind that you'd um, like to talk to us about before? Anything that we didn't cover that you thought, yeah, I wish Jerry would had asked me about this? Uh Gosh, no. I mean, I, I could I could talk about population all day. The the one last thing I'll say on uh, population. First off, you if you're a listener and you're interested in these arguments, you can read Julian Simon's Ultimate Resource too. And as, in a certain sense, it's timeless. Uh, but I I would also the one last thing I'll say is one of the big things that Malthus was concerned about is uh, the law of diminishing returns. Uh, and so listeners, that, that's basically just that, well, if we add more people, the, the first people did the most valuable things. And, and by definition, then the second people are going to do the second most valuable things. And eventually, people's, the value of the things people are doing is going to be very low. And so if we have diminishing returns, that means the more people we add, the less we're going to get. Hmm. Th- this idea ignores, though, uh, the fundamental concept of entrepreneurship. Right. And so people aren't just laborer cogs that you put in the machine and they do a little bit less each time. People actually create entrepreneurial ideas, Bitcoin being a great example of that. Right. And so uh, to me, when thinking about population, when thinking about people in general, my main confidence and, and my, my main uh, optimism in terms of population is based on this uh, entrepreneurial aspect that we see people use again and again. Uh, in ways that, in fact, even can't be totally regulated away. I mean, we saw this w- with uh, Jack Ma in China, though he's he's uh, faced whatever punishment they gave him. But still, he, just in spite of his regulations, he created this this massive, uh, you know, fantastically beneficial to the people business. Hmm. And, and so, uh, t- to me, that that's where the the optimism about business uh, and, and economics lies is in the entrepreneur. The diminishing returns argument ignores the fact that people can be reassigned to new things, right? So the classic right. textbook is you've got one person working an acre, you add two people and the productivity per person goes up because maybe one person is hoeing and the other person is seeding, right? And there's division of labor. And then you add another and then you, at some point people are just tripping over one another, right? You get diminishing returns and then right. negative returns. But of course, in the real world, they go to a different acre or go yes. to the city and do something brand new. So they you can keep deploying them to the higher value added. At the, at the moment where the productivity gains are dropping off, they get deployed to a new thing, S-curve, a new thing with high productivity gains. Uh, of course, if you have a stagnant economy, it's probably true. In a stagnant economy where you're not allowed to grow and there's no entrepreneurship, I mean, there's a world in which Malthus is right. You know, communist countries had a lot of starvation and not just the politically imposed part. Um, and so maybe that's Say's influence. Yeah, but if yeah. you let them be productive, then we're more minds than mouths. All right. Yeah, that, that that's exactly right. Uh, if we have institutions that let us be free to, to innovate and create, we're never going to run out of uh, new acres, we'll say, metaphorically. New, new uh, acres. But, but, but if you, and if now you digital get rid of that acres. innovation. Now yeah, acres dig- in cyberspace. It, yeah. yeah, digital acres. Uh, uh, without uh, endorsing uh, Zuckerberg's vision necessarily, meta acres, right? Something like that. So. <laughs> Peter Jacobson from uh, Ottawa University, Gwartney Center and Faith and Economics Podcast. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time with us today. And thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on, Jerry. And to have you.